Good morning. I am so excited to be here with you guys today. I always say frequently that, um, that you guys are my favorite audience. I, you know, I get to talk to other genetic counselors, I get to talk to doctors, I get to talk to just average folks, but talking to people with fibroid disease and families living with fibroid disease is by far my favorite audience. So today my goal is to really give us the basic groundwork about fibroid disease so we're all on the same page and as we move forward with all the nitty gritty details we're going to hear today about treatments and children and living with fibroid disease that we're all on the same page from the very basic beginning. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest. I always like to declare them so you know what things are going in and out of my life. And these are my learning objectives. Now, many of you have spent a lot of, you know, your whole lives with Fabry disease, and you're like, Dawn, I already know all about Fabry disease. But we've learned so many things in the past five years, I think it's important to start with the basics before we build up from there. And I would like to acknowledge first and foremost that you guys are the experts. It's just that I go to a lot of conferences, so I get to learn a lot of new things as we go. Okay, so let's start with the very basics. This is the stuff you learn back in school. When we talk about our bodies, our bodies are all made up of cells. And in every cell, we've got genetic information that's our instructions for how we make our bodies. And there's different types of cells all over our bodies. So when you hear nephrologists talk about parts of Fabry disease, they'll talk about different types of cells, filtering cells called podocytes. People will talk about epithelial cells that line blood vessels. You just need to know that every one of those cells has a lysosome. And every one of those lysosomes is gunk that builds up because we're missing some things in Fabry disease. The lysosome, as I mentioned, is the recycling center. We have them in most of our cells. And then we talk about those instructions in our body. We're talking about genes that are all spelled a certain way. And we talk about specifically the GLA gene, which is when it's changed, is what causes fibroid disease. And what it's specifically doing, that GLA gene, when it's misspelled, is that it no longer makes the enzyme alpha-galactosidase A the way that it should. It's pretty simple, right? Cells, lysosomes, stuff in there, instructions not working. This is how I like to think about mutations. So there's different changes everybody can have in their genes and different changes in different families, right? So if we went through this room, some of you would say, oh, I've got this gene change and nobody else who's not related to you has that gene change. Other people will have a gene change that's a little bit more common in GLA and you'll say, oh, well, I have this gene change and my friend over here has that gene change. It's good. But each type of gene change and the way the misspelling works tells us what kind of, uh, we put it into categories because that can be easier to talk about how different things affect how your gene works. Because some misspellings will cause an enzyme to just be misfolded and not be able to get in the cell they want. Other types of gene changes are gonna cause the enzyme to be taken out by quality control before it even makes it to the enzyme. And some changes make your enzyme is just this tiny little stub that really doesn't do anything, so it gets broken down immediately. I'm not gonna go through every single spelling of these, but this is my analogy that I like to use. Okay, let's say that you are going out to the store and you're gonna leave a note for your significant other. And you're like, okay, if the cat starts to gag, hairball, throw them into the cage, right? So they can do their business and you can get them out later. So the way that we should leave this note would be cat, cage, at, gag. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> and the whole reason I use these letters is because these are the actual letters we use to spell genes. It took me a while to think of that one. All right. So if I had just a little spelling mistake and I said cat, cage, at, t -t -t gag, you would still know what I was talking about, right? The cat would still get in the cage if there was some gagging. <laughs> Not quite the way you'd expect it to be, but it's okay. But what if we did something like a nonsense mutation and I said, cat, cat, tag. And you're like, okay, I'll get the cat a tag. I don't know what you're talking about, right? That enzyme, pff, not helpful as a means of communication at all. So you see how each of these types of gene changes kind of changes the spelling and changes what you know how to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. Okay. So I keep talking about these enzyme things. Why do we care about enzyme? Well, enzymes are kind of like the scissors or the blades in a garbage disposal. 
Their job is to break things down in the lysosome so it can be recycled and used again. Our bodies are very efficient. Let's put it out there. Good job, bodies. But what if your scissors don't work? And a particular pair of scissors will not cut down what it needs to cut down. Well, that's when it builds up in your lysosomes and builds up in your cells. And builds up what I, I like fondly call gunk, right? The official name of the gunk that builds up in our cells, if our enzyme isn't working, is globotriacylceramide. But there's also some other products that build up as well, other glycolipids, and you'll hear about those as globotriacylceramide or lysoglobotriacylceramide. Here in Australia, I believe you call it GB3, is that right, when you shorten it? So now we've got GB3 and lysoGB3. That's the gunk that stores up in our cells. But we've been learning a little bit more about these two things as we've been going through the years. We used to think the big problem is the gunk is building up in the cells, which makes the blood vessels narrower. We've now learned not only this gunk building up in the cells and making the blood vessels narrower, as that gunk in the form of lysoGB3 is also acting as an irritant to our bodies. So it's not just in fibroid disease that's building up and causing problems. It's actually a problem itself just by being there. Hmm. Things we've learned. So you got your gunk narrowing your blood vessels, but also it irritates the cells that leads to your body to do an inflammatory reaction. You know when you sprain your ankle and it swells up and it gets red and you've got to ice it or cool it or whoever you're talking to at that moment? Our cells do something on the very small cellular level. They send out help signals when they're in trouble. And this lysoGB3 tells our body, hey you guys, let's stop being a powerhouse. Let's stop doing what we're supposed to be doing and let's just be really irritated. Does that sound kind of like what happens in your body sometimes? Yeah. So we go from making energy, we, the lysoGB3 tells our cells, let's now start just being irritated and try to figure out what we need to solve. So it's like taking your brain and focusing it from one aspect of building and changing and making energy and focusing it all on there's something wrong in our bodies. Let's figure out what's wrong. We just figured this out fairly recently, unfortunately. <laughs> you would think it would have come earlier, but very smart people working on this, right? So let's put it together. We've got our cell, and our cell is our lysosome. In our lysosome, we're supposed to have enzymes that are designed to go from where they're created to move into our lysosome, break down the gunk so we aren't having irritated cells, also not having buildup and narrowed blood vessels, and then that's supposed to all work well. If it doesn't work that way, the gunk builds up. You guys already know this probably, but the buildup of this lysosomal GL3, GB3 and lysoGB3 happens before you're even born. There were studies done back in the 70s that showed that there was already corneal whorls in the eyes before babies were born. They showed up there was already storage in those epithelial cells lining the, the blood vessels of the kidneys before the baby's even born. But we know that just that storage isn't enough because there's not yet the irritant, the permanent damage that needs to be done, which is great because it means if we start treatment early, we can hopefully head off this stuff that results in permanent damage. In our world, permanent damage would be renal failure, heart problems, right? So if we can start treatment earlier, we can prevent that from happening. And if we start it later, you know, it's not gonna reverse the damage, but hopefully we can hold stable. This again was something we've just learned over the past 10 years. The fact that storage is there earlier, we already knew. The fact that treatment starting earlier is better. But over the years, we've been learning more about what's the point at which you need to start therapy. What is the point where you know a baby, you know, is a son, you know you've had your son and he's gonna have fibroid disease. When do you start him on therapy? Everybody's got a different answer throughout the world. Everybody. In the states where I work, if a child's having pain, we're gonna start him on therapy. In the UK, there's very specific guidelines on when you can start therapy, and that's how it is here too as well. We have some flexibility based on our insurance in the States. You guys have a better overall healthcare system. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, we all have our pluses and minuses. We also, this was, 
I was very fortunate. I came in to Fabry disease in about 2003 when I started focusing exactly on Fabry disease. And I came in with the knowledge that women had Fabry disease. I didn't have to change my brain around. People who'd been in Fabry disease even one or two years before me were told women are just carriers. But from the very beginning, I've been very fortunate to just say, of course women have symptoms. Because every time I sat in a clinic room and talked to a woman about her son, she'd say, oh yeah, I have that. And I have that too. And in the past, it was just, oh, maybe you do. Now we know women have Fabry disease and women have symptoms, just like men. Now, does every woman have the exact same symptoms as their other male relatives? No. Women are complicated. <laughs> Part of that is because of X inactivation. So when you're born as a woman, before you're born, some of your X's stay on, some of them turn off. So you could have a lot of enzyme that works in your kidney and have some enzyme that's not happening in your heart, but we're not gonna biopsy every little bit of your body to figure that out. We're just gonna stick with what we can do, which is ask you and watch with the assessments we can do. But we call that lionization. So I like to think of it as like a calico cat, got patches of enzyme, patches of color, just like a cat with different colors. <laughs> the other thing is, okay, I'd say in the past five years, we've started using classic and non-classic as terminology. And part of this has to do with newborn screening we've been doing. So when some states in the United States are doing uh, newborn screening for Fabry disease, and it's something that kind of came along as a me too. So they were testing for different cousin diseases that are lysosomal, and they just added Fabry on because they could. Other states have not done that, and they're not going to do it anytime soon because it's very controversial because we don't know when to start therapy, right? Everybody agrees that it would be good to know early, as early as possible about Fabry disease. But there is controversy about whether or not you want to know and then treat right away. So we go back and forth in the United States and every state has their own opinion on newborn screening and they get to te figure out what they test on their own. At any rate, for the ones that were testing, they were finding a lot of people who had Fabry disease, but it wasn't the classic one. It wasn't pain in the hands and feet in childhood. It wasn't angiokeratomas in childhood. It wasn't, um, you know, renal problems starting, you know, in 20s, 30s, 40s. So they're like, well, what do we call that? It's a little bit different and it's not showing up the exact same way. And so they thought about it and they said, well, we have what we call cardiac variant and we have what we call renal variant and we have what we call, you know, you know, atypical Fabry. And they said, well, why don't we just put it on a spectrum? Classic symptoms in childhood, non-classic, everything else. It's a very descriptive bucket. But it does give us the opportunity to, when we do studies to say, okay, this person has classic Fabry disease. This is the gene change they have. This is their family history of having certain things early in life. And then non-classic Fabry disease doesn't mean, oh, this is no big deal. No, no, no. It just means that they didn't have those symptoms in the first 10 days, first 10 years of life. Does that make sense? We still need to do a lot of work with non-classic because non-classic folk can have early kidney failure. They can have early heart disease. They can have pain. It's just that it's not necessarily during the first 10 years of life. Got a little more work to do there, I know. It's kind of like saying like, you're in or you're out of this bucket. Hmm. We gotta do more. But you guys are helping us as we go through, learn more about it. And when you guys participate in studies, it helps us understand even better. Oh, I should mention there's one, um, uh, one particular area in the U.S. where they want to call classic type 1 and non-classic type 2 Fabry disease. So if you ever see those terms, that's what that means. It's not really a popular decision. It's not one that I like, so I'm a little biased here. I didn't put that in my disclosures, but I don't really like type 1 and type 2. I like classic and non-classic better than type 1 and type 2. So when we think about, this is just showing you, when we think about classic Fabry disease, we're thinking about this childhood symptoms, adolescent symptoms, and adult symptoms. Non-classic Fabry disease, just like a big lump, lump everything else. One of the coolest papers that came out that made me so excited happened, it's been a little bit now, 2013 is when it first came out, and this is work by Tondell. And um, she's in the Netherlands, I believe. Norway. See, Americans, we just don't know our geography. <laughs> it's some country that's really cold. Norway. She did this wonderful work. 
and thanks to the families that agreed to do this. There is a series of boys, it's a very small study, and these boys had a kidney biopsy before they started therapy, and they had a kidney biopsy five years later, like clockwork. Nobody missed, everybody was on target, and everybody had this biopsy and this next biopsy. When they looked at this, they looked deep into the kidneys, and they looked at those deep kidney filtering cells, the ones that filter out things that we want to keep and things we don't want to keep. And they saw that when they started people on therapy, at one milligram per kilogram every two weeks, the two people who started when they were teenagers, one who was I think, nine and one who was a teenager, cleared those deep filtering cells out, which was awesome. It was the first proof that showed us that not only could we clear out the blood vessels in the kidney, but we could clear out those deep, important filtering units. And this was real proof. There had not been real proof before, just as saying, we think this is going to be better. And me, who says, we started this young guy when he was seven on therapy, and now he's a mover in Tennessee, which is a really hot state. And he's like bulky, and he's like six feet one. That is not what his uncle looked like. But that doesn't hold weight. This holds weight. Again, little bitty study, just a few people, but it gave us our first taste of what true proof could be of starting therapy early being such a good thing. This is work I did long, long ago. We used to always run around quoting numbers, like, okay, you know, when you're in a family and you find someone with Fabry disease, their other family members have Fabry as well. And I said, well, you know, we're kind of guessing, but let's actually take some family histories. Let's count up the number who are affected. And we found on average, when one person has Fabry disease in a family, they have five additional family members. And this particular piece of information is very useful when you're talking to somebody who doesn't know about Fabry disease. Because you could say, look, eye doctor, you are really important because you are like a superhero. If you find corneal whorls and you get them tested for Fabry disease, you could find five other people and help them as well. That's a pretty powerful message, particularly if you're talking to somebody who's like, oh, that's a rare disease, we're never gonna see it. You're like, yes, but if you do, you can save six people, not just one. It's a big deal. Um, you guys, I'm sure, know X-linked inheritance. The fun thing about X-linked inheritance is that women have two X's and men have an X and a Y. So it gets really complicated when you're trying to explain to people why your dad doesn't have boys with Fabry disease, but you as a woman, you could pass on Fabry disease to your sons. It's like, what? You're blowing my brain away. But you just think of it this way. Men have an X and a Y, and they can pass on that Y all day long to all their sons. But since it has nothing to do with Fabry disease, it doesn't matter. Make all the boys you want. But if you have a girl, you've got no choice. You only have one X. You're gonna pass on that X that has Fabry disease each time, unless random miracles occur. I'm sure it's happened, I haven't found it yet. Genetics is very strange, weird things happen. But that's why we test everybody just to make sure, right? When you're talking about a woman, we've got two X's. We can pass one on, we can pass the other one on. We have nothing to do with gender, despite that king in England who believed we did. So when we've got our two X's, we just pass on one or the other. Either it has Fabry disease on it or it doesn't. 50-50. Does that make sense? Mm. It gets confusing. So I have the diagrams. Sometimes the diagrams are more confusing though. When we test for Fabry disease, if you are a woman, the best way to do it is to know what the gene changes in the family and test for that one. If you don't know in your family what the gene change is, then they can read through the gene and figure out the change, and then they can test everybody else in your family. Very handy. If you're a man, we can start with doing alpha galactosidase enzyme testing, but the only drawback is there's a couple little changes in the gene that don't cause fibroid disease, but then cause lower enzyme. So we recommend, and where I work, we do enzyme, but then we follow it up with reading through the gene and finding the changes. Enzyme assay can only be done on blood. The genetic testing where we read through the gene can be done on both blood or saliva. So that's sometimes nice that you can do it at home and send it in if it's just saliva. That's a diagram that says what I just told you. <laughs> uh, there, are, there is another type of genetic testing we can do. So we read through and look at the spelling of the gene, but sometimes that test misses big chunks missing out of the genes or big added things. And there's a couple really big families in the States where they have 
um, genetic information where the spelling was duplicated and the regular sequencing testing never picked it up. But since we know that family, we know that it can be expanded and we look for it. So we would do enzyme testing in the men. They would say something is not right. The GLA gene should have a problem. Then we went back and looked through the GLA gene and the first head said, we don't see any problems. So then we did the second test and it made more sense. And the reason for that is if you're reading a really good book and one page is completely torn out or one page is added, sometimes you're like, oh, that's an interesting choice, author, and you keep going, right? You don't think about it too much. You figure it's a flashback or a flash forward or something. Like that with your genes, if you're missing a big chunk, the test is looking for certain key points and it just hops right over that and keeps on reading. And that's why the second test is gonna pick it up, that deletion duplication test, when the read through would not. We talked about this a little bit, but there's a lot of different gene changes that cause Fabry disease in the GLA gene. And we just try to put them into a database so that we can figure out what each one means as we get them. But as we do newborn screening, we do um, testing where we do people's whole genome, we're gonna find different changes and we're gonna have to figure out what each one means or doesn't mean. Um, I have to go really fast because the timekeepers look at me. You're going to hear more about treatment later, so I'll leave this one be. But you may hear about amenable mutations. That just means it's a gene change that can be helped with a certain medication called megalostat or galifold. Some people can, some people can't. And it has more to do with whether what kind of problem is caused by a gene change more than anything else. Ask me sometime about this analogy. It's really fun. Um, and there's different guidelines, as I mentioned, for each place, how you determine who to put on therapy, how you figure out what test to do at a particular time. You don't have to memorize them, but feel free to ask your doctors, like, hey, you know, are there anything, any tests we should be doing? Are there new guidelines? Are there new things we should be thinking about? And that's my family tree. If you look out here, you'll see them over there, too. <laughs> They're in the hot tub. <laughs> Thank you so much.